Preface and Chapter One of Arthur Mervyn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret Espyot. Arthur Mervyn by Charles Brockton Brown. Preface and Chapter One. The evils of pestilence by which this city has lately been afflicted will probably form an era in its history. The schemes of reformation and improvement to which they will give birth, or if no efforts of human wisdom can avail to avert the periodical visitations of this calamity, the change in manners and population which they will produce will be in the highest degree memorable. They have already supplied new and copious materials for reflection to the physician and the political economist. They have not been less fertile of instruction to the moral observer to whom they have furnished new displays of the influence of human passions and motives. Amidst the medical and political discussions which are now afloat in the community relative to this topic, the author of these remarks has ventured to methodize his own reflections, and to weave into a humble narrative such incidents as appeared to him most instructive and remarkable among those which came within the sphere of his own observation. It is every one's duty to profit by all opportunities of inculcating on mankind the lessons of justice and humanity, the influences of hope and fear, the trials of fortitude and constancy which took place in this city in the autumn of 1793, have perhaps never been exceeded in any age. It is but just to snatch some of these from oblivion, and to deliver to posterity a brief but faithful sketch of the condition of this metropolis during that calamitous period. Men only required to be made acquainted with distress for their compassion and their charity to be awakened. He that depicts, in lively colors, the evils of disease and poverty, performs an eminent service to the sufferers, by calling forth benevolence in those who are able to afford relief, and he who portrays examples of disinterestedness and intrepidity confers on virtue the notoriety and homage that are due to it, and rouses in the spectators the spirit of salutary emulation. In the following tale a particular series of adventures is brought to a close, but these are necessarily connected with the events which happened subsequent to the period here described. These events are not less memorable than those which form the subject of the present volume, and may hereafter be published, either separately or in addition to this. Charles Brockton Brown Chapter 1 I was resident in this city during the year 1793, Many motives contributed to detain me, though departure was easy and commodious, and my friends were generally solicitous for me to go. It is not my purpose to enumerate these motives, or to dwell on my present concerns and transactions, but merely to compose a narrative of some incidents with which my situation made me acquainted. Returning one evening, somewhat later than usual, to my own house, my attention was attracted, just as I entered the porch, by the figure of a man reclining against the wall at a few paces distant. My sight was imperfectly assisted by a far-off lamp, but the posture in which he sat, the hour and the place, immediately suggested the idea of one disabled by sickness. It was obvious to conclude that his disease was pestilential. This did not deter me from approaching and examining him more closely. He leaned his head against the wall, his eyes were shut, his hands clasped in each other, and his body seemed to be sustained in an upright position merely by the cellar door against which he rested his left shoulder. The lethargy into which he was sunk seemed scarcely interrupted by my feeling his hand and his forehead, his throbbing temples and burning skin indicated a fever, and his form, already emaciated, seemed to prove that it had not been of short duration. There was only one circumstance that hindered me from forming an immediate determination in what manner this person should be treated. 
My family consisted of my wife and a young child. Our servant-maid had been seized three days before by the reigning malady, and at her own request had been conveyed to the hospital. We ourselves enjoyed good health and were hopeful of escaping with our lives. Our measures for this end had been cautiously taken and carefully adhered to. They did not consist in avoiding the receptacles of infection, for my office required me to go daily into the midst of them, nor in filling the house with exhalations of gunpowder, vinegar, or tar. They consisted in cleanliness, reasonable exercise, and wholesome diet. Custom had likewise blunted the edge of our apprehensions. To take this person into my house and bestow upon him the requisite attendance was the scheme that first occurred to me. In this, however, the advice of my wife was to govern me. I mentioned the incident to her. I pointed out the danger which was to be dreaded from such an inmate. I desired her to decide with caution, and mentioned my resolution to conform myself implicitly to her decision. Should we refuse to harbor him, we must not forget that there was a hospital to which he would, perhaps, consent to be carried, and where he would be accommodated in the best manner the times would admit. Nay, said she, talk not of hospitals. At least let him have his choice. I have no fear about me, for my part, in a case where the injunctions of duty are so obvious. Let us take the poor unfortunate wretch into our protection and care, and leave the consequences to heaven. I expected and was pleased with this proposal. I returned to the sick man, and, on rousing him from his stupor, found him still in possession of his reason. With a candle near, I had an opportunity of viewing him more accurately. His garb was plain, careless, and denoted rusticity. His aspect was simple and ingenuous, and his decayed visage still retained traces of uncommon but manlike beauty. He had all the appearances of mere youth, unspoiled by luxury and uninured to misfortune. I scarcely ever beheld an object which laid so powerful and sudden a claim to my affection and succor. "'You are sick,' said I, in as cheerful a tone as I could assume. "'Cold bricks and night airs are comfortless attendants for one in your condition. Rise, I pray you, and come into the house. We will try to supply you with accommodations a little more suitable.' At this address he fixed his languid eyes on me. "'What would you have?' said he. "'I am very well as I am. While I breathe, which will not be long, I shall breathe with more freedom here than elsewhere. Let me alone. I am very well as I am.' "'Nay,' said I, "'this situation is unsuitable to a sick man. I only ask you to come into my house and receive all the kindness that is in our power to bestow.' Pluck up courage, and I will answer for your recovery, provided you submit to directions, and do as we would have you. Rise, and come along with me. We will find you a physician and a nurse, and all we ask in return is good spirits and compliance. Do you not know, he replied, what my disease is? Why should you risk your safety for the sake of one whom your kindness cannot benefit, and who has nothing to give in return? There was something in the style of this remark that heightened my prepossession in his favor, and made me pursue my purpose with more zeal. "'Let us try what we can for you,' I answered. "'If we save your life, we shall have done you some service, and, as for recompense, we will look to that.' It was with considerable difficulty that he was persuaded to accept our invitation. He was conducted to a chamber— and, the criticalness of his case requiring unusual attention, I spent the night at his bedside. My wife was encumbered with both the care of her infant and her family. The charming babe was in perfect health, but her mother's constitution was frail and delicate. We simplified the household duties as much as possible, but still these duties were considerably burdensome to one not used to the performance, and luxuriously educated. The addition of a sick man was likely to be productive of much fatigue. My engagements would not allow me to be always at home, and the state of my patient and the remedies necessary to be prescribed 
were attended with many noxious and disgustful circumstances. My fortune would not allow me to hire assistance. My wife, with a feeble frame and a mind shrinking, on ordinary occasions, from such offices, with fastidiousness scrupulousness, was to be his only or principal nurse. My neighbors were fervent in their well-meant zeal, and loud in their remonstrances on the imprudence and rashness of my conduct. They called me presumptuous and cruel in exposing my wife and child, as well as myself, to such imminent hazard for the sake of one, too, who most probably was worthless, and whose disease had doubtless been, by negligence or mistreatment, rendered incurable. I did not turn a deaf ear to these censurers. I was aware of all the inconveniences and perils to which I thus spontaneously exposed myself. No one knew better the value of that woman who I called mine, or set a higher price upon her life, her health, and her ease. The virulence and activity of this contagion, the dangerous condition of my patient, and the dubiousness of his character were not forgotten by me, but still my conduct in this affair received my own entire approbation. All objections on the score of my friends were removed by her own willingness and even solicitude to undertake the province. I had more confidence than others in the vincibility of this disease and in the success of those measures which we had used for our defense against it. But whatever were the evils to accrue to us, we were sure of one thing, namely, that the consciousness of having neglected this unfortunate person would be a source of more unhappiness than could possibly redound from the attendance and care that he would claim. The more we saw of him, indeed, the more did we congratulate ourselves on our proceeding. His torments were acute and tedious, but in the midst even of delirium his heart seemed to overflow with gratitude, and to be actuated by no wish but to alleviate our toil and our danger. He made prodigious exertions to perform necessary offices for himself. He suppressed his feelings and struggled to maintain a cheerful tone and countenance that he might prevent that anxiety which the sight of his sufferings produced in us. He was perpetually furnishing reasons why his nurse should leave him alone, and betrayed dissatisfaction whenever she entered his apartment. In a few days there were reasons to conclude him out of danger, and in a fortnight nothing but exercise and nourishment were wanting to complete his restoration. Meanwhile nothing was obtained from him but general information that his place of abode was Chester County, and that some momentous engagement induced him to hazard his safety by coming to the city in the height of the epidemic. He was far from being talkative. His silence seemed to be the joint result of modesty and unpleasing remembrances. His features were characterized by pathetic seriousness, and his deportment by a gravity very unusual at his age. According to his own representation, he was no more than eighteen years old, but the depth of his remarks indicated a much greater advance. His name was Arthur Mervyn. He described himself as having passed his life at the plough-tail and the threshing-floor, as being destitute of all scholastic instruction, and as being long since bereft of the affectionate regards of parents and kinsmen. When questioned as to the course of life which he meant to pursue upon his recovery, he professed himself without any precise object. He was willing to be guided by the advice of others, and by the lights which experience should furnish. The country was open to him, and he supposed that there was no part of it in which food could not be purchased by his labor. He was unqualified by his education for any liberal profession. His poverty was likewise an insuperable impediment. He could afford to spend no time in the acquisition of a trade. He must labor, not for future emolument, but for immediate subsistence. The only pursuit which his present circumstances would allow him to adopt 
was that which, he was inclined to believe, was likewise the most eligible. Without doubt his experience was slender, and it seemed absurd to pronounce concerning that of which he had no direct knowledge, but so it was, he could not outroot from his mind the persuasion that to plough, to sow, and to reap were employments most befitting a reasonable creature, and from which the truest pleasure and the least pollution would flow. He contemplated no other scheme than to return, as soon as his health should permit, into the country, seek employment where it was to be had, and acquit himself in his engagements with fidelity and diligence. I pointed out to him various ways in which the city might furnish employment to one with his qualifications. He had said that he was somewhat accustomed to the pen. There were stations in which the possession of a legible hand was all that was requisite. He might add to this a knowledge of accounts, and thereby procure himself a post in some mercantile or public office. To this he objected, that experience had shown him unfit for the life of a penman. This had been his chief occupation for a little while, and he found it wholly incompatible with his health. He must not sacrifice the end for the means. Starving was a disease preferable to consumption. Besides, he labored merely for the sake of living, and he lived merely for the sake of pleasure. If his tasks should enable him to live, but at the same time bereave him of all satisfaction, they inflicted injury and were to be shunned as worse evils than death. I asked to what species of pleasure he alluded, with which the business of a clerk was inconsistent. He answered that he scarcely knew how to describe it. He read books when they came in his way. He had lighted upon few, and perhaps the pleasure they afforded him was owing to their fewness, yet he confessed that a mode of life which entirely forbade him to read was by no means to his taste. But this was trivial. He knew how to value the thoughts of other people, but he could not part with the privilege of observing and thinking for himself. He wanted business, which would suffer at least nine-tenths of his attention to go free. If it afforded agreeable employment to that part of his attention which it applied to its own use, so much the better, but if it did not, he should not repine. He should be content with a life whose pleasures were to its pains as nine are to one. He had tried the trade of a copyist, and in circumstances more favorable than it was likely he should ever again have an opportunity of trying it, and he had found that it did not fulfill the requisite conditions, whereas the trade of plowman was friendly to health, liberty, and pleasure. The pestilence, if it may so be called, was now declining. The health of my young friend allowed him to breathe the fresh air and to walk. A friend of mine, by name Wortley, who had spent two months from the city, and to whom, in the course of a familiar correspondence, I had mentioned the foregoing particulars, returned from his rural excursion. He was posting, on the evening of the day of his arrival, with a friendly expedition to my house, when he overtook Mervyn going in the same direction. He was surprised to find him go before him into my dwelling, and to discover, which he speedily did, that this was the youth whom I had so frequently mentioned to him. I was present at their meeting. There was a strange mixture in the countenance of Wortley when they were presented to each other. His satisfaction was mingled with surprise, and his surprise with anger. Mervyn, in his turn, betrayed considerable embarrassment. Wortley's thoughts were too earnest on some topic to allow him to converse. He shortly made some excuse for taking leave, and, rising, addressed himself to the youth with a request that he would walk home with him. This invitation, delivered in a tone which left it doubtful whether a compliment or a menace were meant, augmented Mervyn's confusion. He complied without speaking, and they went out together. My wife and I were left to comment upon the scene. It could not fail to excite uneasiness. 
They were evidently no strangers to each other. The indignation that flashed from the eyes of Wortley and the trembling consciousness of Mervyn were unwelcome tokens. The former was my dearest friend and venerable for his discernment and integrity. The latter appeared to have drawn upon himself the anger and disdain of this man. We already anticipated the shock which the discovery of his unworthiness would produce. In a half hour Mervyn returned. His embarrassment had given place to dejection. He was always serious, but his features were now overcast by the deepest gloom. The anxiety which I felt would not allow me to hesitate long. Arthur, said I, something is the matter with you. Will you not disclose it to us? Perhaps you have brought yourself into some dilemma out of which we may help you to escape. Has anything of an unpleasant nature passed between you and Wortley? The youth did not readily answer. He seemed at a loss for a suitable reply. At length he said that something disagreeable had indeed passed between him and Wortley. He had the misfortune to be connected with a man by whom Wortley conceived himself to be injured. He had borne no part in inflicting this injury, but had nevertheless been threatened with ill treatment if he did not make disclosures which, indeed, it was in his power to make, but which he was bound by every sanction to withhold. This disclosure would be of no benefit to Wortley. It would rather operate injuriously than otherwise, yet it was endeavored to be wrested from him by the heaviest menaces. There he paused. We were naturally inquisitive as to the scope of these menaces, but Mervyn entreated us to forbear any further discussion of this topic. He foresaw the difficulties to which his silence would subject him. One of its most fearful consequences would be the loss of our good opinion. He knew not what he had to dread from the enmity of Wortley. Mr. Wortley's violence was not without excuse. It was his mishap to be exposed to suspicions which could only be obviated by breaking his faith. But indeed he knew not whether any degree of explicitness would confute the charges that were made against him, whether, by trampling on his sacred promise, he should not multiply his perils instead of lessening their number. A difficult part had been assigned to him, by much too difficult for one young, improvident, and inexperienced as he was. Sincerity, perhaps, was the best course. Perhaps, after having had an opportunity for deliberation, he should conclude to adopt it, Meanwhile he entreated permission to retire to his chamber. He was unable to exclude from his mind ideas which yet could, with no propriety, at least at present, be made the theme of conversation. These words were accompanied with simplicity and pathos, and with tokens of unaffected distress. Arthur, said I, you are master of your actions and time in this house. Retire when you please, but you will naturally suppose us anxious to dispel this mystery. Whatever shall tend to obscure or malign your character will, of course, excite our solicitude. Wortley is not short-sighted or hasty to condemn. So great is my confidence in his integrity that I will not promise my esteem to one who has irrecoverably lost that of Wortley." I am not acquainted with your motives to concealment, or what it is you conceal, but take the word of one who possesses that experience which you complain of wanting, that sincerity is always safest. As soon as he retired, my curiosity prompted me to pay an immediate visit to Wortley. I found him at home. He was no less desirous of an interview, and answered my inquiries with as much eagerness as they were made. "'You know,' said he, "'my disastrous connection with Thomas Welbeck. You recollect his sudden disappearance last July, by which I was reduced to the brink of ruin. Nay, I am even now far from certain that I shall survive that event. I spoke to you about the youth who lived with him, and by what means that youth was discovered to have crossed the river in his company on the night of his departure. This is that very youth. 
This will account for my emotion at meeting him at your house. I brought him out with me. His confusion sufficiently indicated his knowledge of transactions between Welbeck and me. I questioned him as to the fate of that man. To own the truth, I expected some well-digested lie, but he merely said that he had promised secrecy on that subject, and must therefore be excused from giving me any information. I asked him if he knew that his master, or accomplice, or whatever was his relation to him, absconded in my debt. He answered that he knew it well, but still pleaded a promise of inviolable secrecy as to his hiding-place. This conduct justly exasperated me, and I treated him with the severity which he deserved. I am half ashamed to confess the excesses of my passion. I even went so far as to strike him. He bore my insults with the utmost patience. No doubt the young villain is well instructed in his lesson. He knows that he may safely defy my power. From threats I descended to entreaties. I even endeavored to wind the truth from him by artifice. I promised him a part of the debt if he would enable me to recover the whole. I offered him a considerable reward if he would merely afford me a clue by which I might trace him to his retreat. But all was insufficient. He merely put on an air of perplexity and shook his head in token of non-compliance. Such was my friend's account of this interview. His suspicions were unquestionably plausible, but I was disposed to put a more favorable construction on Mervyn's behavior. I recollected the desolate and penniless condition in which I found him, and the uniform complacency and rectitude of his deportment for the period during which we had witnessed it. These ideas had considerable influence on my judgment, and indisposed me to follow the advice of my friend, which was to turn him forth from my doors that very night. My wife's prepossessions were still more powerful advocates of this youth. She would vouch, she said, before any tribunal for his innocence, but she willingly concurred with me on allowing him the continuance of our friendship on no other condition than that of a disclosure of the truth. To entitle ourselves to this confidence we were willing to engage, in our turn, for the observance of secrecy, so far that no detriment should accrue from this disclosure to himself or his friend. Next morning at breakfast our guest appeared with a countenance less expressive of embarrassment than on the last evening. His attention was chiefly engaged by his own thoughts, and little was said till the breakfast was removed. I then reminded him of the incidents of the former day, and mentioned that the uneasiness which thence arose to us had rather been increased than diminished by time. "'It is in your power, my young friend,' continued I, "'to add still more to this uneasiness, or to take it entirely away. I had no personal acquaintance with Thomas Welbeck. I have been informed by others that his character, for a certain period, was respectable, but that, at length, he contracted large debts, and instead of paying them, absconded. You, it seems, lived with him. On the night of his departure you are known to have accompanied him across the river, and this, it seems, is the first of your reappearance on the stage. Welbeck's conduct was dishonest. He ought doubtless to be pursued to his asylum and be compelled to refund his winnings. You confess yourself to know his place of refuge, but urge a promise of secrecy. Know you not that to assist or connive at the escape of this man was wrong? To have promised to favor his concealment and impunity by silence was only an aggravation of this wrong. That, however, is past. Your youth and circumstances, hitherto unexplained, may apologize for that misconduct, but it is certainly your duty to repair it to the utmost of your power. Think whether, by disclosing what you know, you will not repair it. I have spent most of last night, said the youth, in reflecting on this subject. I had come to a resolution before you spoke of confiding to you my simple tale. I perceive in what circumstances I am placed, and that I can keep my hold of your good opinion only by a candid deportment. 
I have indeed given a promise which it was wrong, or rather absurd, in another to exact, and in me to give, yet none but considerations of the highest importance would persuade me to break my promise. No injury will accrue from my disclosure to Welbeck. If there should, dishonest as he was, that would be a sufficient reason for my silence. Wortley will not in any degree be benefited by any communication that I can make. Whether I grant or withhold information, my conduct will have an influence only on my own happiness, and that influence will justify me in granting it. I received your protection when I was friendless and forlorn. You have a right to know whom it is that you protected. My own fate is connected with the fate of Welbeck, and that connection, together with the interest you are pleased to take in my concerns, because they are mine, will render a tale worthy of attention which will not be recommended by variety of facts or skill in the display of them. Wortley, though passionate, and, with regard to me, unjust, may yet be a good man, but I have no desire to make him one of my auditors. You, sir, may, if you think proper, relate to him afterwards what particulars concerning Welbeck it may be of importance for him to know, but at present it will be well if your indulgence shall support me to the end of a tedious but humble tale. The eyes of my Eliza sparkled with delight at this proposal. She regarded this youth with a sisterly affection, and considered his candor in this respect as an unerring test of his rectitude. She was prepared to hear and to forgive the errors of inexperience and precipitation. I did not fully participate in her satisfaction, but was nevertheless most zealously disposed to listen to his narrative. My engagements obliged me to postpone this rehearsal till late in the evening. Collected then round a cheerful hearth, exempt from all likelihood of interruption from without, and our babe's unpractised senses shut up in the sweetest and profoundest sleep, Mervyn, after a pause of recollection, began. End of chapter 1《of Arthur Mervyn》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Arthur Mervyn by Charles Brockton Brown Chapter 2 My natal soil is Chester County. My father had a small farm, on which he has been able by industry to maintain himself and a numerous family. He has had many children, but some defect in the constitution of our mother has been fatal to all of them but me. They died successively as they attained the age of nineteen or twenty, and since I have not yet reached that age, I may reasonably look for the same premature fate. In the spring of last year my mother followed her fifth child to the grave, and three months afterwards died herself. My constitution has always been frail, and till the death of my mother I enjoyed unlimited indulgence. I cheerfully sustained my portion of labor, for that necessity prescribed, but the intervals were always at my own disposal, and, in whatever manner I thought proper to employ them, my plans were encouraged and assisted. Fond appellations, tones of mildness, solicitous attendance when I was sick, deference to my opinions, and veneration for my talents, compose the image which I still retain of my mother. I had the thoughtlessness and presumption of youth, and now that she is gone, my compunction is awakened by a thousand recollections of my treatment of her. I was indeed guilty of no flagrant acts of contempt or rebellion. Perhaps her deportment was inevitably calculated to instil into me a forward and refractory spirit. My faults, however, were speedily followed by repentance, and in the midst of impatience and passion, a look of tender upbraiding from her was always sufficient to melt me into tears and make me ductile to her will. 
If sorrow for her loss be an atonement for the offenses which I committed during her life, ample atonement has been made. My father is a man of slender capacity, but of a temper easy and flexible. He was sober and industrious by habit. He was content to be guided by the superior intelligence of his wife. Under this guidance he prospered, but when that was withdrawn his affairs soon began to betray marks of unskilfulness and negligence. My understanding, perhaps, qualified me to counsel and assist my father, but I was wholly unaccustomed to the task of superintendence. Besides, gentleness and fortitude did not descend to me from my mother, and these were indispensable attributes in a boy who desires to dictate to his grey-headed parent. Time, perhaps, might have conferred dexterity on me, or prudence on him, had not a most unexpected event given a different direction to my views. Betty Lawrence was a wild girl from the pine forests of New Jersey. At the age of ten years she became a bound servant in this city, and after the expiration of her time came into my father's neighborhood in search of employment. She was hired in our family as a milkmaid and market-woman. Her features were coarse, her frame robust, her mind totally unlettered, and her morals defective in that point in which female excellence is supposed chiefly to consist. She possessed superabundant health and good humor, and was quite a supportable companion in the hayfield or the barnyard. On the death of my mother she was exalted to a somewhat higher station. The same tasks fell to her lot, but the time and manner of performing them were, in some degree, submitted to her own choice. The cows and the dairy were still her province, but in this no one interfered with her or pretended to prescribe her measures. For this province she seemed not unqualified, and as long as my father was pleased with her management I had nothing to object. This state of things continued, without material variation, for several months. There were appearances in my father's deportment to Betty, which excited my reflections, but not my fears. The deference which was occasionally paid to the advice or the claims of this girl was accounted for by that feebleness of mind which degraded my father, in whatever scene he should be placed, to be the tool of others. I had no conception that her claims extended beyond a temporary or superficial gratification. At length, however, a visible change took place in her manners. A scornful affectation and awkward dignity began to be assumed. A greater attention was paid to dress, which was of gayer hues and more fashionable texture. I rallied her on these tokens of a sweetheart, and amused myself with expatiating to her on the qualifications of her lover. A clownish fellow was frequently her visitant. His attentions did not appear to be discouraged. He therefore was readily supposed to be the man. When pointed out as the favorite, great resentment was expressed, and obscure insinuations were made that her aim was not quite so low as that. These denials I supposed to be customary on such occasions, and considered the continuance of his visits as a sufficient confutation of them. I frequently spoke of Betty, her newly acquired dignity, and of the probable cause of her change of manners to my father. When this theme was started, a certain coldness and reserve overspread his features. He dealt in monosyllables, and either labored to change the subject or made some excuse for leaving me. This behavior, though it occasioned surprise, was never very deeply reflected on. My father was old, and the mournful impressions which were made upon him by the death of his wife, the lapse of almost half a year seemed scarcely to have weakened. Betty had chosen her partner, and I was in daily expectation of receiving a summons to the wedding. One afternoon this girl dressed herself in the gayest manner and seemed making preparations for some momentous ceremony. My father had directed me to put the horse to the chaise. 
On my inquiring whither he was going, he answered me, in general terms, that he had some business at a few miles' distance. I offered to go in his stead, but he said, that was impossible. I was proceeding to ascertain the possibility of this, when he left me to go to a field where his workmen were busy, directing me to inform him when the chaise was ready, to supply his place, while absent, in overlooking the workmen. This office was performed, but before I called him from the field I exchanged a few words with the milkmaid who sat on a bench, in all the primness of expectation, and decked with the most gaudy plumage. I rated her imaginary lover for his tardiness, and vowed eternal hatred to them both for not making me a bride's attendant. She listened to me with an air in which embarrassment was mingled sometimes with exultation, and sometimes with malice. I left her at length, and returned to the house not till a late hour. As soon as I entered, my father presented Betty to me as his wife, and desired she might receive that treatment from me which was due to a mother. It was not till after repeated and solemn declarations from both of them that I was prevailed upon to credit this event. Its effect upon my feelings may be easily conceived. I knew the woman to be rude, ignorant, and licentious. Had I suspected this event, I might have fortified my father's weakness and enabled him to shun the gulf to which he was tending, but my presumption had been careless of the danger. To think that such a one should take the place of my revered mother was intolerable. To treat her in any way not squaring with her real merits, to hinder anger and scorn from rising at the sight of her in her new condition was not in my power. To be degraded to the rank of her servant, to become the sport of her malice and her artifices, was not to be endured. I had no independent provision, but I was the only child of my father, and had reasonably hoped to succeed to his patrimony. On this hope I had built a thousand agreeable visions. I had meditated innumerable projects, which the possession of this estate would enable me to execute. I had no wish beyond the trade of agriculture, and beyond the opulence which a hundred acres would give. These visions were now at an end. No doubt her interest would be, to this woman, the supreme law, and this would be considered as irreconcilably hostile to mine. My father would easily be moulded to her purpose, and that act easily extorted from him which should reduce me to beggary. She had a gross and perverse taste. She had a numerous kindred, indigent and hungry. On these his substance would speedily be lavished. Me she hated, because she was conscious of having injured me, because she knew that I held her in contempt, and because I had detected her in an illicit intercourse with the son of a neighbor. The house in which I lived was no longer my own, nor even my father's. Hitherto I had thought and acted in it with the freedom of a master, but now I was become, in my own conceptions, an alien and enemy to the roof under which I was born. Every tie which had bound me to it was dissolved or converted into something which repelled me to a distance from it. I was a guest whose presence was borne with anger and impatience. I was fully impressed with the necessity of removal, but I knew not whither to go or what kind of subsistence to seek. My father had been a Scottish emigrant and had no kindred on this side of the ocean. My mother's family lived in New Hampshire, and long separation had extinguished all rights of relationship in her offspring. Tilling the earth was my only profession, and, to profit by my skill in it, it would be necessary to become a day-laborer in the service of strangers. But this was a destiny to which I, who had so long enjoyed the pleasures of independence and command, could not suddenly reconcile myself. It occurred to me that the city might afford me an asylum. A short day's journey would transport me into it. I had been there twice or thrice in my life, but only for a few hours each time. 
I knew not a human face, and was a stranger to its modes and dangers. I was qualified for no employment compatible with a town life but that of the pen. This, indeed, had ever been a favorite tool with me, and though it may appear somewhat strange, it is no less true that I had had nearly as much practice at the quill as at the mattock. But the sum of my skill lay in tracing distinct characters. I had used it merely to transcribe what others had written, or to give form to my own conceptions. Whether the city would afford me employment as a mere copyist sufficiently lucrative was a point on which I possessed no means of information. My determination was hastened by the conduct of my new mother. My conjectures as to the course she would pursue with regard to me had not been erroneous. My father's deportment in a short time grew sullen and austere. Directions were given in a magisterial tone, and any remissness in the execution of his orders was rebuked with an air of authority. At length these rebukes were followed by certain intimations that I was now old enough to provide for myself, that it was time to think of some employment by which I might secure a livelihood, that it was a shame for me to spend my youth in idleness, that what he had gained was by his own labor, and I must be indebted for my living to the same source. These hints were easily understood. At first they excited indignation and grief. I knew the source whence they sprung, and was merely able to suppress the utterance of my feelings in her presence. My looks, however, were abundantly significant, and my company became hourly more insupportable. Abstracted from these considerations, my father's remonstrances were not destitute of weight. He gave me being, but sustenance ought surely to be my own gift. In the use of that for which he had been indebted to his own exertions, he might reasonably consult his own choice." He assumed no control over me, he merely did what he would with his own, and, so far from fettering my liberty, he exhorted me to use it for my own benefit, and to make provision for myself. I now reflected that there were other manual occupations besides that of the plough. Among these none had fewer disadvantages than that of carpenter or cabinet-maker, I had no knowledge of this art, but neither custom nor law, nor the impenetrableness of the mystery, required me to serve a seven years' apprenticeship to it. A master in this trade might possibly be persuaded to take me under his tuition. Two or three years would suffice to give me the requisite skill. Meanwhile my father would, perhaps, consent to bear the cost of my maintenance. Nobody could live upon less than I was willing to do. I mentioned these ideas to my father, but he merely commended my intentions without offering to assist me in the execution of them. He had full employment, he said, for all the profits of his ground. No doubt if I would bind myself to serve four or five years, my master would be at the expense of my subsistence. Be that as it would, I must look for nothing from him. I had shown very little regard for his happiness. I had refused all marks of respect to a woman who was entitled to it from her relation to him. He did not see why he should treat as a son one who refused what was due to him as a father. He thought it right that I should henceforth maintain myself. He did not want my services on the farm, and the sooner I quitted his house the better. I retired from this conference with a resolution to follow the advice that was given. I saw that henceforth I must be my own protector, and wondered at the folly that detained me so long under his roof. To leave it was now become indispensable, and there could be no reason for delaying my departure for a single hour. I determined to bend my course to the city. The scheme foremost in my mind was to apprentice myself to some mechanical trade. 
I did not overlook the evils of constraint and the dubiousness as to the character of the master I should choose. I was not without hopes that accident would suggest a different expedient, and enable me to procure an immediate subsistence without forfeiting my liberty. I determined to commence my journey the next morning. No wonder the prospect of so considerable a change in my condition should deprive me of sleep. I spent the night ruminating on the future, and painting to my fancy the adventures which I should be likely to meet. The foresight of man is in proportion to his knowledge. No wonder that in my state of profound ignorance not the faintest preconception should be formed of the events that really befell me. My temper was inquisitive, but there was nothing in the scene to which I was going from which my curiosity expected to derive gratification. Discords and evil smells, unsavory food, unwholesome labor, and irksome companions were, in my opinion, the unavoidable attendants of a city. My best clothes were of the homeliest texture and shape. My whole stock of linen consisted of three check shirts. Part of my winter's evening's employment, since the death of my mother, consisted in knitting my own stockings. Of these I had three pair, one of which I put on, and the rest I formed together with two shirts into a bundle. Three quarter-dollar pieces composed my whole fortune in money. End of chapter 2 three of Arthur Mervyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Arthur Mervyn by Charles Brockton Brown. Chapter three. I rose at the dawn and, without asking or bestowing a blessing, sallied forth into the high road to the city, which passed near the house. I left nothing behind, the loss of which I regretted. I had purchased most of my own books with the product of my own separate industry and their number being, of course, small, I had, by incessant application, gotten the whole use of them by rote. They had ceased, therefore, to be of any further use. I left them without reluctance to the fate for which I knew them to be reserved, that of affording food and habitation to mice. I trod this unwanted path with all the fearlessness of youth. In spite of the motives to despondency and apprehension incident to my state, my heels were light and my heart joyous. Now, said I, I am mounted into man. I must build a name and fortune for myself. Strange if this intellect and these hands will not supply me with an honest livelihood. I will try the city in the first place, but if that should fail, resources are still left to me. I will resume my post in the cornfield and threshing-floor, to which I shall always have access, and where I shall always be happy. I had proceeded some miles on my journey when I began to feel the inroads of hunger. I might have stopped at any farmhouse, and have breakfasted for nothing. It was prudent to husband, with the utmost care, my slender stock— but I felt reluctance to beg as long as I had the means of buying, and I imagined that coarse bread and a little milk would cost little even at a tavern, when any farmer was willing to bestow them for nothing. My resolution was further influenced by the appearance of a signpost. What excuse could I make for begging a breakfast with an inn at hand and silver in my pocket? I stopped accordingly and breakfasted. The landlord was remarkably attentive and obliging, but his bread was stale, his milk sour, and his cheese the greenest imaginable. I disdained to animadvert on these defects, naturally supposing that his house could furnish no better. Having finished my meal, I put, without speaking, one of my pieces into his hand. This deportment I conceived to be highly becoming, and to indicate a liberal and manly spirit. I always regarded with contempt a scrupulous maker of bargains. He received the money with a complacent obeisance. "'Right,' said he. "'Just the money, sir. You're on foot, sir. A pleasant way of travelling, sir. I wish you a good day, sir.' So saying, he walked away. 
This proceeding was wholly unexpected. I conceived myself entitled to at least three-fourths of it in change. The first impulse was to call him back and contest the equity of his demand, but a moment's reflection showed me the absurdity of such conduct. I resumed my journey with spirits somewhat depressed. I have heard of voyagers and wanderers in deserts who were willing to give a casket of gems for a cup of cold water. I had not supposed my own condition to be in any respect similar, yet I had just given one-third of my estate for a breakfast. I stopped at noon at another inn. I counted on purchasing a dinner for the same price, since I meant to content myself with the same fare. A large company was just sitting down to a smoking banquet. The landlord invited me to join them. I took my place at the table, but was furnished with bread and milk. Being prepared to depart, I took him aside. "'What is to pay?' said I. "'Did you drink anything, sir?' "'Certainly I drank the milk which was furnished.' "'But any liquors, sir?' "'No.' He deliberated a moment, and then, assuming an air of disinterestedness, "'Tis our custom to charge dinner and club, but as you drank nothing, we'll let the club go. A mere dinner is half a dollar, sir.' He had no leisure to attend to my fluctuations. After debating with myself on what was to be done, I concluded that compliance was best, and leaving the money at the bar, resumed my way. I had not performed more than half my journey, yet my purse was entirely exhausted. This was a specimen of the cost incurred by living at an inn. If I entered the city, a tavern must, at least for some time, be my abode, but I had not a farthing remaining to defray my charges. My father had formerly entertained a boarder for a dollar per week, and in case of need I was willing to subsist upon coarser fare and lie on a harder bed than those which our guest had been supplied. These facts had been the foundation of my negligence on this occasion. What was now to be done? To return to my paternal mansion was impossible. To relinquish my design of entering the city and to seek a temporary asylum, if not permanent employment, at some one of the plantations within view, was the most obvious expedient. These deliberations did not slacken my pace. I was almost unmindful of my way, when I found I had passed Schoolkill at the upper bridge. I was now within the precincts of the city, and night was hastening." it behooved me to come to a speedy decision. Suddenly I recollected that I had not paid the customary toll at the bridge, neither had I money wherewith to pay it. A demand of payment would have suddenly arrested my progress, and so slight an incident would have precluded that wonderful destiny to which I was reserved. The obstacle that would have hindered my advance now prevented my return." scrupulous honesty did not require me to turn back and awaken the vigilance of the toll-gatherer. I had nothing to pay, and by returning I should only double my debt. Let it stand, said I, where it does. All that honor enjoins is to pay when I am able. I adhered to the crossways till I reached Market Street. Night had fallen, and a triple row of lamps presented a spectacle enchanting and new. My personal cares were, for a time, lost in the tumultuous sensations which I was now engrossed. I had never visited the city at this hour. When my last visit was paid I was a mere child. The novelty which environed every object was, therefore, nearly absolute. I proceeded with more cautious steps, but was still absorbed in attention to passing objects. I reached the market-house, and, entering it, indulged myself in new delight and new wonder. I need not remark that our ideas of magnificence and splendor are merely comparative, yet you may be prompted to smile when I tell you that, in walking through this avenue, I for a moment conceived myself transported to the hall, pendant with many a row of starry lamps and blazing crescents, fed by naphtha and asphaltos. 
that this transition from my homely and quiet retreat had been effected in so few hours wore the aspect of miracle or magic. I proceeded from one of these buildings to another till I reached their termination in Front Street. Here my progress was checked, and I sought repose to my weary limbs by seating myself on a stall. No wonder some fatigue was felt by me, accustomed as I was to strenuous exertions, since, exclusive of the minutes spent at breakfast and dinner, I had travelled fifteen hours and forty-five miles. I began now to reflect with some earnestness on my condition. I was a stranger, friendless and moneyless. I was unable to purchase food and shelter, and was wholly unused to the business of begging. Hunger was the only serious inconvenience to which I was immediately exposed. I had no objection to spend the night in the spot where I then sat. I had no fear that my visions would be troubled by the officers of the police. It was no crime to be without a home, but how should I supply my present cravings and the cravings of to-morrow? At length it occurred to me that one of our country neighbors was probably at this time in the city. He kept a store as well as cultivated a farm. He was a plain and well-meaning man, and, should I be so fortunate as to meet him, his superior knowledge of the city might be of essential benefit to me in my present forlorn circumstances. His generosity might likewise induce him to lend me so much as would purchase one meal. I had formed the resolution to leave the city next day, and was astonished at the folly that had led me into it, but meanwhile my physical wants must be supplied. Where should I look for this man? In the course of conversation I recollected him to have referred to the place of his temporary abode. It was an inn, but the sign or the name of the keeper for some time withstood all my efforts to recall them. At length I lighted on the last. It was Lesher's Tavern. I immediately set out in search of it. After many inquiries I at last arrived at the door. I was preparing to enter the house when I perceived that my bundle was gone. I had left it on the stall where I had been sitting. People were perpetually passing to and fro. It was scarcely possible not to have been noticed. No one that I observed it would fail to make it his prey. Yet it was of too much value to me to allow me to be governed by a bare probability. I resolved to lose not a moment in returning. With some difficulty I retraced my steps, but the bundle had disappeared. The clothes were in themselves of small value, but they constituted the whole of my wardrobe, and I now reflected that they were capable of being transmuted by the pawn or sale of them into food. There were other wretches as indigent as I was, and I consoled myself by thinking that my shirts and stockings might furnish a seasonable covering to their nakedness. But there was a relic concealed within this bundle, the loss of which could scarcely be endured by me. It was the portrait of a young man who died three years ago at my father's house, drawn by his own hand. He was discovered one morning in the orchard with many marks of insanity upon him. His air and dress bespoke some elevation of rank and fortune. My mother's compassion was excited, and, as his singularities were harmless, an asylum was afforded him, though he was unable to pay for it. He was constantly declaiming in an incoherent manner about some mistress who had proved faithless. His speeches seemed, however, like the rantings of an actor to be rehearsed by rote or for the sake of exercise. He was totally careless of his person and health, and by repeated negligences of this kind, at last contracted a fever of which he speedily died. The name which he assumed was Clavering. He gave no distinct account of his family, but stated in loose terms that they were residents in England, high-born and wealthy, that they had denied him the woman whom he loved, and banished him to America, under penalty of death, if he should dare to return, and that they had refused him all means of subsistence in a foreign land. He predicted in his wild and declamatory way his own death. He was very skilful at the pencil, and drew this portrait a short time before his dissolution, 
presented it to me and charged me to preserve it in remembrance of him. My mother loved the youth because he was amiable and unfortunate, and chiefly because she fancied a very powerful resemblance between his countenance and mine. I was too young to build affection on any rational foundation. I loved him for whatever reason, with an ardor unusual at my age, and which this portrait had contributed to prolong and to cherish. In thus finally leaving my home I was careful not to leave this picture behind. I wrapped it in paper in which a few elegiac stanzas were inscribed in my own hand, and with the utmost elegance of penmanship. I then placed it in a leathern case which, for greater security, was deposited in the center of my bundle. It will occur to you, perhaps, that it would be safer in some fold or pocket of the clothes which I wore. I was of a different opinion, and was now to endure the penalty of my error. It was in vain to heap execrations on my negligence, or to consume the little strength left to me in regrets. I returned once more to the tavern, and made inquiries for Mr. Capper, the person whom I have just mentioned as my father's neighbor. I was informed that Capper was now in town, that he had lodged on the last night at this house, that he had expected to do the same to-night, but a gentleman had called ten minutes ago, whose invitation to lodge with him to-night had been accepted. They had just gone out together. Who, I asked, was the gentleman? The landlord had no knowledge of him. He knew neither his place of abode nor his name. Was Mr. Capper expected to return hither in the morning? No, he had heard the stranger propose to Mr. Capper to go with him into the country to-morrow, and Mr. Capper, he believed, had assented. This disappointment was peculiarly severe. I had lost by my own negligence the only opportunity that would offer of meeting my friend. Had even the recollection of my loss been postponed for three minutes, I should have entered the house, and a meeting would have been secured. I could discover no other expedient to obviate the present evil. My heart began now for the first time to droop. I looked back, with nameless emotions, on the days of my infancy. I called up the image of my mother. I reflected on the infatuation of my surviving parent, and the usurpation of the detestable Betty with horror. I viewed myself as the most calamitous and desolate of human beings. At this time I was sitting in the common room. There were others in the same apartment, lounging or whistling or singing. I noticed them not, but, leaning my head upon my hand, I delivered myself up to painful and intense meditation. From this I was roused by someone placing himself on the bench near me and addressing me thus. "'Pray, sir, if you will excuse me, who was the person whom you were looking for just now? Perhaps I can give you the information you want. If I can, you will be very welcome to it.' I fixed my eyes with some eagerness on the person that spoke. He was a young man, expensively and fashionably dressed, whose mien was considerably prepossessing, and whose countenance bespoke some portion of discernment. I described to him the man whom I sought. "'I am in search of the same man myself,' said he, "'but I expect to meet him here. He may lodge elsewhere, but he promised to meet me here at half after nine. I have no doubt he will fulfill his promise, so that you will meet the gentleman.' I was highly gratified by this information, and thanked my informant with some degree of warmth. My gratitude he did not notice, but continued, "'In order to beguile expectation, I have ordered supper. Will you do me the favor to partake with me, unless indeed you have supped already?' I was obliged, somewhat awkwardly, to decline his invitation, conscious as I was that the means of payment were not in my power." He continued, however, to urge my compliance, till at length it was, though reluctantly, yielded. My chief motive was the certainty of seeing Capper. My new acquaintance was exceedingly conversable, but his conversation was chiefly characterized by frankness and good humor. My reserve gradually diminished, and I ventured to inform him, in general terms, of my former condition and present views. 
He listened to my details with seeming attention, and commented on them with some judiciousness. His statements, however, tended to discourage me from remaining in the city. Meanwhile the hour passed, and Capper did not appear. I noticed this circumstance to him with no little solicitude. He said that possibly he might have forgotten or neglected his engagement. His affair was not of the highest importance, and might be readily postponed to a future opportunity. He perceived that my vivacity was greatly damped by this intelligence. He importuned me to disclose the cause. He made himself very merry with my distress when it was at length discovered. As to the expense of supper, I had partaken of it at his invitation. He therefore should, of course, be charged with it. As to lodging, he had a chamber and a bed, which he would insist upon my sharing with him. My faculties were thus kept upon the stretch of wonder. Every new act of kindness in this man surpassed the fondest expectation that I had formed. I saw no reason why I should be treated with benevolence. I should have acted in the same manner if placed in the same circumstances, yet it appeared incongruous and inexplicable. I know whence my ideas of human nature were derived. They certainly were not the offspring of my own feelings. These would have taught me that interest and duty were blended in every act of generosity. I did not come into the world without my scruples and suspicions. I was more apt to impute kindnesses to sinister and hidden than to obvious and laudable motives. I paused to reflect upon the possible designs of this person. What end could be served by this behavior? I was no subject of violence or fraud. I had neither trinket nor coin to stimulate the treachery of others. What was offered was merely lodging for the night. Was this an act of such transcendent disinterestedness as to be incredible? My garb was meaner than that of my companion, but my intellectual accomplishments were at least upon a level with his. Why should he be supposed to be insensible to my claims upon his kindness? I was a youth destitute of experience, money, and friends, but I was not devoid of all mental and personal endowments. That my merit should be discovered, even on such slender intercourse, had nothing in it that shocked belief. While I was thus deliberating, my new friend was earnest in his solicitations for my company. He remarked my hesitation, but ascribed it to a wrong cause. Come, said he, I can guess your objections, and can obviate them. You are afraid of being ushered into company, and people who have passed their lives like you have a wonderful antipathy to strange faces. But this is bedtime with our family, so that we can defer your introduction to them till to-morrow. We may go to our chamber without being seen by any but servants. I had not been aware of this circumstance. My reluctance flowed from a different cause, but, now that the inconveniences of ceremony were mentioned, they appeared to me of considerable weight. I was well pleased that they should thus be avoided, and consented to go along with him. We passed several streets and turned several corners. At last we turned into a kind of court, which seemed to be chiefly occupied by stables. "'We will go,' said he, "'by the back way into the house.' We shall thus save ourselves the necessity of entering the parlor, where some of the family may still be. My companion was as talkative as ever, but said nothing from which I could gather any knowledge of the number, character, and condition of his family. End of chapter 3 4 of Arthur Mervyn This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Arthur Mervyn by Charles Brockton Brown Chapter 4 We arrived at a brick wall, through which we passed by a gate into an extensive court or yard. The darkness would allow me to see nothing but outlines. Compared with the pygmy dimensions of my father's wooden hovel, the buildings before me were of gigantic loftiness. The horses were here far more magnificently accommodated than I had been. By a large door we entered an elevated hall. "'Stay here,' said he, "'just a while while I fetch a light.' He returned, bearing a candle, before I had time to ponder on my present situation. 
We now ascended a staircase covered with painted canvas. No one whose inexperience is less than mine can imagine to himself the impressions made upon me by surrounding objects. The height to which this stair ascended, its dimensions and its ornaments appeared to me a combination of all that was pompous and superb. We stopped not till we had reached the third story. Here my companion unlocked and led the way into a chamber. This, he said, is my room. Permit me to welcome you into it. I had no time to examine this room before, by some accident, the candle was extinguished. Curse upon my carelessness, said he. I must go down and light the candle. I will return in a twinkling. Meanwhile, you may undress yourself and go to bed. He went out, and as I afterwards recollected, locked the door behind him. I was not indisposed to follow his advice, but my curiosity would first be gratified by a survey of the room. Its height and spaciousness were imperfectly discernible by starlight and by gleams from a street lamp. The floor was covered with a carpet, the walls with brilliant hangings, the bed and windows were shrouded by curtains of a rich texture and glossy hues. Hitherto I had merely read of these things. I knew them to be the decorations of opulence, and yet as I viewed them and remembered where and what I was on the same hour the preceding day, I could scarcely believe myself awake, or that my senses were not beguiled by some spell. Where, said I, will this adventure terminate? I rise on the morrow with the dawn and speed into the country. When this night is remembered, how like a vision it will appear! If I tell the tale by a kitchen fire, my veracity will be disputed. I shall be ranked with the story-tellers of Shiraz and Baghdad. Though busied in these reflections, I was not inattentive to the progress of time. Methought my companion was remarkably dilatory. He went merely to relight his candle, but certainly he might during this time have performed the operation ten times over. Some unforeseen accident might occasion his delay. Another interval passed, and no tokens of his coming. I began now to grow uneasy. I was unable to account for his detention. Was not some treachery designed? I went to the door and found that it was locked. This heightened my suspicions. I was alone, a stranger, in an upper room of the house. Should my conductor have disappeared by design or by accident, and some one of the family should find me here, what would be the consequence? Should I not be arrested as a thief and conveyed to prison? My transition from the street to this chamber would not be more rapid than my passage hence to a jail. These ideas struck me with panic. I revolved them anew, but they only acquired greater plausibility. No doubt I had been the victim of malicious artifice. Inclination, however, conjured up opposite sentiments, and my fears began to subside. What motive, I asked, could induce a human being to inflict wanton injury? I could not account for his delay, but how numberless were the contingencies that might occasion it. I was somewhat comforted by these reflections, but the consolation they afforded was short-lived. I was listening, with the utmost eagerness, to catch the sound of a foot, when a noise was indeed heard, but totally unlike a step. It was human breath, struggling, as it were, for passage. On the first effort of attention it appeared like a groan. Whence it arose I could not tell. He that uttered it was near, perhaps, in the room." Presently the same noise was heard again, and now I perceived that it came from the bed. It was accompanied with a motion like someone changing his posture. What I at first conceived to be a groan appeared now to be nothing more than the expiration of a sleeping man. What should I infer from this incident? My companion did not apprise me that the apartment was inhabited. Was his imposture a jestful or a wicked one? There was no need to deliberate. There were no means of concealment or escape. The person would some time awaken and detect me. 
the interval would only be fraught with agony, and it was wise to shorten it. Should I not withdraw the curtain, awake the person, and encounter at once all the consequences of my situation? I glided softly to the bed. When the thought occurred, may not the sleeper be a female? I cannot describe the mixture of dread and of shame which glowed in my veins. The light in which such a visitant would be probably regarded by a woman's fears, the precipitate alarms that might be given, the injury which I might unknowingly inflict or undeservedly suffer, threw my thoughts into painful confusion. My presence might pollute a spotless reputation, or furnish fuel to jealousy. Still, though it were a female, would not less injury be done by gently interrupting her slumber? But the question of sex still remained to be decided. For this end I once more approached the bed and drew aside the silk. The sleeper was a babe. This I discovered by the glimmer of a street lamp. Part of my solicitudes were now removed. It was plain that this chamber belonged to a nurse or a mother. She had not yet come to bed. Perhaps it was a married pair, and their approach might be momently expected. I pictured to myself their entrance and my own detection. I could imagine no consequence that was not disastrous and horrible, and from which I would not at any price escape. I again examined the door and found that exit by this avenue was impossible. There were other doors in this room. Any practicable expedient in this extremity was to be pursued. One of these was bolted. I unfastened it and found a considerable space within. Should I immer myself in this closet? I saw no benefit that would finally result from it. I discovered that there was a bolt on the inside which would somewhat contribute to security. This being drawn, no one could enter without breaking the door. I had scarcely paused when the long-expected sound of footsteps was heard in the entry. Was it my companion or a stranger? If it were the latter, I had not yet mustered courage sufficient to meet him. I cannot applaud the magnanimity of my proceeding, but no one can expect intrepid or judicious measures from one in my circumstances. I stepped into the closet and closed the door. Some one immediately after unlocked the chamber door. He was unattended with a light. The footsteps, as they moved along the carpet, could scarcely be heard. I waited impatiently for some token by which I might be governed. I put my ear to the keyhole, and at length heard a voice, but not that of my companion, exclaim, somewhat above a whisper, "'Smiling cherub, safe and sound, I see. Would to God my experiment may succeed, and that thou mayest find a mother where I have found a wife.' There he stopped. He appeared to kiss the babe, and, presently retiring, locked the door after him. These words were capable of no consistent meaning. They served at least to assure me that I had been treacherously dealt with. This chamber, it was manifest, did not belong to my companion. I put up prayers to my deity that he would deliver me from these toils. What a condition was mine! Immersed in palpable darkness, shut up in this unknown recess, lurking like a robber! My meditations were disturbed by new sounds. The door was unlocked. More than one person entered the apartment, and light streamed through the keyhole. I looked, but the aperture was too small, and the figures passed too quickly to permit me the sight of them. I bent my ear, and this imparted some more authentic information. The man, as I judged by the voice, was the same who had just departed. Rustling of silk denoted his companion to be a female. Some words being uttered by the man, in too low a key to be overheard, the lady burst into a passion of tears. He strove to comfort her by soothing tones and tender appellations. "'How can it be helped?' said he. "'It is time to resume your courage. Your duty to yourself and to me requires you to subdue this unreasonable grief.' He spoke frequently in this strain, but all he said seemed to have little influence in pacifying the lady. 
At length, however, her sobs began to lessen in vehemence and frequency. He exhorted her to seek for some repose. Apparently she prepared to comply, and conversation was for a few moments intermitted. I could not but advert to the possibility that some occasion to examine the closet in which I was immured might occur. I knew not in what manner to demean myself if this should take place. I had no option at present. By withdrawing myself from view I had lost the privilege of an upright deportment. Yet the thought of spending the night in this spot was not to be endured. Gradually I began to view the project of bursting from the closet and trusting to the energy of truth and of an artless tale, with more complacency. More than once my hand was placed upon the bolt, but withdrawn by a sudden faltering of resolution. When one attempt failed, I recurred once more to such reflections as were adapted to renew my purpose. I preconcerted the address which I should use. I resolved to be perfectly explicit, to withhold no particular of my adventures from the moment of my arrival. My description must necessarily suit some person within their knowledge. All I should want was liberty to depart, but if this were not allowed, I might at least hope to escape any ill-treatment, and to be confronted with my betrayer. In that case I did not fear to make him the attester of my innocence. Influenced by these considerations, I once more touched the lock. At that moment the lady shrieked and exclaimed, "'Good God! What is here?' An interesting conversation ensued. The object that excited her astonishment was the child. I collected from what passed that the discovery was wholly unexpected by her. Her husband acted as if equally unaware of this event. He joined in all her exclamations of wonder and all her wild conjectures. When these were somewhat exhausted, he artfully insinuated the propriety of bestowing care upon the little foundling. I now found that her grief had been occasioned by the recent loss of her own offspring. She was for some time averse to her husband's proposal, but at length was persuaded to take the babe to her bosom and give it nourishment. This incident had diverted my mind from its favorite project, and filled me with speculations on the nature of the scene. One explication was obvious that the husband was the parent of this child, and had used this singular expedient to procure for it the maternal protection of his wife. It would soon claim from her all the fondness which she entertained for her own progeny. No suspicion probably had yet, or would hereafter, occur with regard to its true parent. If her character be distinguished by the usual attributes of women, the knowledge of this truth may convert her love into hatred. I reflected with amazement on the slightness of that thread by which human passions are led from their true direction. With no less amazement did I remark the complexity of incidents by which I had been empowered to communicate to her this truth. How baseless are the structures of falsehood which we build in opposition to the system of eternal nature! If I should escape undetected from this recess, it will be true that I never saw the face of either of these persons, yet I am acquainted with the most secret transaction of their lives." My own situation was now more critical than before. The lights were extinguished, and the parties had sought repose. To issue from the closet now would be imminently dangerous. My counsels were again at a stand, and my designs frustrated. Meanwhile the persons did not drop their discourse, and I thought myself justified in listening. Many facts of the most secret and momentous nature were alluded to. Some allusions were unintelligible. To others I was able to affix a plausible meaning, and some were palpable enough. Every word that was uttered on that occasion is indelibly imprinted on my memory. Perhaps the singularity of my circumstances, and my previous ignorance of what was passing in the world, contributed to render me a greedy listener. 
Most that was said I shall overlook, but one part of the conversation it will be necessary to repeat. A large company had assembled that evening at their house. They criticized the character and manners of several. At last the husband said, "'What think you of the nabob, especially when he talked about riches? How artfully he encourages the notion of his poverty! Yet not a soul believes him. I cannot for my part account for that scheme of his. I half suspect that his wealth flows from a bad source, since he is so studious of concealing it.' "'Perhaps, after all,' said the lady, "'you are mistaken as to his wealth.' "'Impossible!' exclaimed the other. "'Mark how he lives. Have I not seen his bank account? He deposits, since he has been here, amount to no less than half a million.' "'Heaven grant that it be so,' said the lady with a sigh. "'I shall think with less aversion of your scheme. If poor Tom's fortune be made, and he not the worse, or but little the worse on that account, I shall think it on the whole best.' That, replied he, is what reconciles me to the scheme. To him thirty thousand are nothing. But will he not suspect you of some hand in it? How can he? Will I not appear to lose as well as himself? Tom is my brother, but who can be supposed to answer for a brother's integrity? But he cannot suspect either of us. Nothing less than a miracle can bring our plot to light. Besides, this man is not what he ought to be. He will, some time or other, come out to be a grand impostor. He makes money by other arts than bargain and sale. He has found his way by some means to the Portuguese treasury. Here the conversation took a new direction, and after some time the silence of sleep ensued. Who, thought I, is this nabob who counts his dollars by half millions, and on whom it seems as if some fraud was intended to be practised. Amidst their wariness and subtlety, how little are they aware that their conversation has been overheard! By means as inscrutable as those which conducted me hither, I may hereafter be enabled to profit by this detection of a plot. But, meanwhile, what was I to do? How was I to effect my escape from this perilous asylum? After much reflection it occurred to me that to gain the street without exciting their notice was not utterly impossible. Sleep does not commonly end of itself unless at a certain period. What impediments were there between me and the liberty which I could not remove, and remove with so much caution as to escape notice? Motion and sound inevitably go together, but every sound is not attended to. The doors of the closet and the chamber did not creak upon their hinges. The latter might be locked. This I was able to ascertain only by experiment. If it were so, yet the key was probably in the lock and might be used without much noise. I waited till their slow and hoarser inspirations showed them to be both asleep. Just then, on changing my position, my head struck against some things which depended from the ceiling of the closet. They were implements of some kind, which rattled against each other in consequence of this unlucky blow. I was fearful lest this noise should alarm, as the closet was little distant from the bed. The breathing of one instantly ceased, and a motion was made as if the head were lifted from the pillow. This motion, which was made by the husband, awaked his companion, who exclaimed, "'What's the matter?' "'Something, I believe,' replied he, "'is in the closet. If I was not dreaming, I heard the pistols strike against each other, as if someone was taking them down.' This intimation was well suited to alarm the lady. She besought him to ascertain the matter." This, to my utter dismay, he at first consented to do, but presently observed that probably his ears had misinformed him. It was hardly possible that the sound proceeded from them. It might be a rat, or his own fancy might have fashioned it. It is not easy to describe my trepidations while this conference was holding. I saw how easily their slumber was disturbed. The obstacles to my escape were less surmountable than I had imagined. In a little time all was again still. 
I waited till the usual tokens of sleep were distinguishable. I once more resumed my attempt. The bolt was withdrawn with all possible slowness, but I could by no means prevent all sound. My state was full of inquietude and suspense, my attention being painfully divided between the bolt and the condition of the sleepers. The difficulty lay in giving that degree of force which was barely sufficient. Perhaps not less than fifteen minutes were consumed in this operation. At last it was happily effected, and the door was cautiously opened. Emerging as I did from utter darkness, the light admitted into three windows produced to my eyes a considerable illumination. Objects which, on my first entrance into this apartment, were invisible, were now clearly discerned. The bed was shrouded by curtains, yet I shrunk back into my covert, fearful of being seen. To facilitate my escape I put off my shoes. My mind was so full of objects of more urgent moment that the propriety of taking them along with me never occurred. I left them in the closet. I now glided across the apartment to the door. I was not a little discouraged by observing that the key was wanting. My whole hope depended on the omission to lock it. In my haste to ascertain this point, I made some noise which again roused one of the sleepers. He started and cried, "'Who is there?' I now regarded my case as desperate and detection as inevitable. My apprehensions rather than my caution kept me mute. I shrunk to the wall and waited in a kind of agony for the moment that should decide my fate. The lady was again roused. In answer to her inquiries, her husband said that someone, he believed, was at the door, but there was no danger of their entering, for he had locked it, and the key was in his pocket. My courage was completely annihilated by this piece of intelligence. My resources were now at an end. I could only remain in this spot till the morning light, which could be at no great distance, should discover me. My inexperience disabled me from estimating all the perils of my situation. Perhaps I had no more than temporary inconveniences to dread. My intention was innocent, and I had been betrayed into my present situation, not by my own wickedness, but by the wickedness of others. I was deeply impressed with the ambiguousness which would necessarily rest upon my motives and the scrutiny to which they would be subjected. I shuddered at the bare possibility of being ranked with thieves. These reflections again gave edge to my ingenuity in search of the means of escape. I had carefully attended to the circumstances of their entrance. Possibly the act of locking had been unnoticed, but was it not likewise possible that this person had been mistaken? The key was gone. Would this have been the case if the door were unlocked? My fears rather than hopes impelled me to make the experiment. I drew back the latch, and to my unspeakable joy the door opened. I passed through and explored my way to the staircase. I descended till I reached the bottom. I could not recollect with accuracy the position of the door leading into the court, but by carefully feeling along the wall with my hands I at length discovered it. It was fastened by several bolts and a lock. The bolts were easily withdrawn, but the key was removed. I knew not where it was deposited. I thought I had reached the threshold of liberty, but here was an impediment that threatened to be unsurmountable. But if the doors could not be passed, windows might be unbarred. I remembered that my companion had gone into a door on the left hand in search of a light. I searched for this door. Fortunately it was fastened only by a bolt. It admitted me into a room which I carefully explored till I reached a window. I will not dwell on my efforts to unbar this entrance. Suffice it to say that, after much exertion and frequent mistakes, I at length found my way into the yard, and thence passed into the court. End of chapter 4